gather today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's wonderful to be with you this morning. I am Dr. Dennis Bielfeldt, President of the Institute of Lutheran Theology, and I have the honor today of bringing to you the reading from Psalm 119, words we should heed. So, Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it, according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the ordinances of your mouth. I delight in the way of your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. Oh, to be a child again. Hmm? You remember those very early days, those innocent days, when the world was full of meaning and purpose and excitement and possibility. I have an especially vivid memory of being told that I would be starting Sunday school soon and being greatly saddened because I thought that this was going to be the real life school all day, all week long, this school that I was so deeply dreading, and then being relieved, well, this was just Sunday school. Uh, the day arrived for my initial foray into Christian education, and my mother took me to the Lutheran church five miles to the north to go to Sunday school. I would actually be going to the pre-kindergarten class, as it turned out, our meeting place being a little room in the northwest part of the church basement beyond another room. We didn't worry much about fire exits in those days. Many of us there uh, were not yet in school, and this was really my first opportunity to socialize with a bunch of children I did not know. I was frightened, as I recall, because I actually had to interact with these other kids. And the 15 minutes before the other children showed up were a very long 15 minutes, and I was terrified. In fact, I was more terrified than any time in my young life. Uh, but when the other kids came, it was not so bad. And I remember, after it was all done, thinking, hmm, I think I'll come back. It's not so bad. You know? But why talk about this? What difference does it make what happened in a northwest Iowa church basement more than 50 years ago? And how does sharing my story here get to God's story? Well, I bring this up because of the words of the psalm. Listen. The psalmist asks, how can young people keep their way pure? Although I was scared, there was a sense in which I was still pure. <laughs> what? You say pure? No way. Don't you know that you were fallen from the day you were born? Well, of course, I'm a Lutheran theologian. I know this thing. But I did not know it then. I did not know then all of those things in the world that I would later realize were so bad. While I had no doubt been breaking most of the commandments since birth and baptism, I did not then have an awareness of the fact that I was breaking them. I did not have then an awareness of the fact that the world was bad and how hard it was not to be bad. I did not know. I did not live in the word, of course, but I did not know then that I was living outside the word. There is a type of innocence children have, though we all realize that they are anything but innocent. As I went to my class with uh, four-year-olds, I learned more about God and what he wanted. 
I learned about the three men in the fiery furnace and how they were blessed by God. And I learned all about Adam and Eve and how they got thrown out of the garden. The more I learned in these early days, the more I identified with those who had been thrown out. I came to see that it was a very hard thing to do the thing that God would have us do. And then not doing what God would have us do was not a good thing to do. All of us are children once. Some of us can remember those early days when we experienced a world without conflict, a world that somehow seemed more connected to who we are. Others of us may not have explicit memories of that world, but yet recall our earliest, vaguest sense of what we had lost. Some perhaps can only infer an original purity from the experience of self-hatred. Children, even from very good homes, oftentimes do not like themselves very much. And not liking ourselves is a sign of the fall, I think, and a clear witness to the existence of the primal land from which we have been thrown. Ah, but most of us today listening are all grown up. You here have families. Friends, jobs, callings, they're different, you know. Homes, reputation, possessions, time, wealth, interests, love, responsibility, and hopes. Much of the time, we grown-ups simply go about doing the things that we must go about doing. We have obligations, after all. We must care for our families. We don't have time to worry much about such things things as putative primal innocence that we have lost, an innocence that we may not even have deeply known we had. Casting our eyes on this psalm, however, we should wake up. If we take the psalmist seriously, we know that we live in a very dangerous world. We hear, of course, a great deal about the dangerous world in which we live when it comes to terrorism, but we oftentimes miss the most profound of our dangers. Our world is a minefield which we stagger through, seeking to avoid that which brings our deepest death. Can you hear the psalmist cry? He wants desperately to stay on the right road, to not be annihilated by spiritual explosives, to treasure his creator, to love the one whom he should love. He begs to be taught the divine statutes, to meditate properly on the divine precepts, to not forget God's word. The world is a place of spiritual terror, a place that is not at its deepest level, our place, but the place that we are so accustomed to that we can't recognize how foreign it is. Think of all of the doomsday scenarios of terror, anthrax attacks, biological contamination of water supplies, chemical weapons, nuclear detonations, etc., etc. We live our lives constantly thinking of these because we live our lives constantly not thinking of these, I'm sorry, because to think of them would paralyze us. Why do anything at all if the very water we drink might issue in horrible death, right? Because they got some pretty nasty stuff they can put in water. We block this thought and move forward. We have to. And I think we do the same thing with the deepest death that constantly envelops us. We are on the road to nowhere. Imagine beings created for celestial pilgrimage on the road to nowhere. 
Explosions of the most profound magnitude detonate within and without us, and we miss them all. It seems our eyes and our ears don't function here. But the psalmist does not miss what is happening. He knows our childlike purity has been lost, and we are forever not ourselves in the world. We are forever and inescapably set against ourselves, against our neighbors, against those whom we purport to love, against our world, and against our God. And so he begs to be blessed, to be taught, to dwell in God's word. And do you hear that? Do you see what this is all about? Do you see that the primal innocence from which we have fallen, the primal innocence vaguely apprehended in our earliest days, the primal innocence from which we have wandered into lands of dust, desolation, and decay, you see that this innocence is given back in God's word in God's gift of himself to us in Jesus Christ, in God's very heart, in the center of divine being itself. <laughs> in Christ, I am taught your statutes, O God. In Christ, I declare the ordinance of your mouth. In Christ, I delight in the way of your decrees. In Christ, I meditate on your precepts. In Christ, my eyes are transfixed by your ways. In Christ, my delight is full and complete. And in Christ, I resume my journey to my youngest self. And in Christ, we at the Institute of Lutheran Theology build an earthly place to study, to teach, and to proclaim this word, this word in which we dwell. Ours is not a journey, desolate and explosive, but a journey back home. That's why we're here. And this is why Christ came. And in Christ, we truly can and do go back home again. May the grace of God, which passes all of human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, let us pray. You have called us home again, O oh Lord. You have brought us back to the place from which we have wandered. Through your word, through your agency, you save us each and every day of our lives. Lord, in your mercy. You have filled us with your word, O oh Lord, and you have brought us new life. Let us realize the preciousness of this word. Let us, let us turn it over in our minds. Look underneath it. Look above, in, around, beyond. See it. Understand it. See how deeply, how very much deeply it gives the life that we have been looking, searching for and which we have lost. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we earnestly pray that our work in the Institute of Lutheran Theology be in response to your word and be a journey back home again. That our work be done in a spirit of humility, done in a spirit of sharing and friendliness, done in response to what you have done for us. Help us here, guide us, teach us, and make us hearers and doers of your word. 
Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, you have taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.